Welcome to day two of our uh, meeting here at the University of Virginia, where um, both time and space have been so brilliantly organized and so flexibly dealt with. Um, on the question of time, um, I'm empowered by Deb Johnny to extend our session to 10.55. So it will be an hour and 15 minute session, just as it was planned to be, and we'll finish at 10.55. Um, it's my pleasure to <coughs> tell you that this morning's plenary lecture will be given by Lydia Liu, the Won Sung Tam Professor in the Humanities and the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures at Columbia University. I should say that before moving to Columbia in 2006, she held distinguished professorships both in Michigan and Berkeley. She is, like most of us here today, a center director, but Unlike most of us here, she actually runs two centers. One is the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society at Columbia, whose founding director, many of you probably know, was Gayatri Spivak. She is also director of uh, the Xinhua Columbia Center for Translingual and Transcultural Studies, CTTS, at Xinhua University in Beijing. Uh, Lydia herself founded this one and did so with the aim of promoting international collaboration and interdisciplinary research in mainland China, which is one of the main areas of her research. She's the author or editor of many books since the publication in 1995 of her first one, Translingual Practice, Literature, National Culture, and Translated Modernity, China 1900 to 1937, published at Stanford Press. I have to say one of my personal favorites among her books is the influential Harvard Press monograph of 2004, The Clash of Empires, The Invention of China in Modern World Making. Uh, that one, that's uh, Harvard, um, a, a book I know, I'm sure is known to many of you. Um, it's a book that investigates what she calls the semiotic turn in international politics, especially with respect to China and it includes analysis of the politics of translation in domains such as international law, the theory of sovereignty, and the, in my opinion, much neglected subject of grammar, subject, as Lydia would stress, in both senses of that word. The chapter that I found especially rewarding in this book was the account of what she calls the birth of the super sign, which along the way offers what I found to be one of the most original and compelling accounts I've read of the cultural politics of the Opium Wars. The super sign in question is yi, second tone, yi, yi, a word that translates problematically both as barbarian and foreigner, and that figured so crucially in Sino-British relations in the mid-19th century. Both these books have been published both in English and Chinese. Uh, among her work that has been composed in Chinese, I shouldn't fail to mention a work of creative nonfiction, The Nesbitt Code, which won the Hong Kong Book Award in 2014. Indeed, there is a great deal more to report about in this impressive scholarly record, including edited collections on feminist theory and international perspective and translation theory, but um, it's going to be soon time for Lydia herself to, to talk. Uh, I do want to say that Lydia joined the board of CHCI uh, just recently um, and that CHCI stands to benefit greatly uh, in key areas of our uh, uh, interest going forward. Um, already in her first board meeting, she's helped us to think in great depth about our ongoing interest in translation studies and counseled us on how to find partners for humanities collaborations in mainland China, a goal that has long eluded us. And then finally, I should say that I think that one of the reasons that the conference organizers thought of Lydia for a meeting devoted to humanities informatics was the publication in 2010 at the University of Chicago Press of the Freudian Robot Digital Media and the Future of the Unconscious, this beautiful book. Uh, this is a book that actually marks a new departure for her uh, into a set of issues at the conjunction of new media studies, technology studies, grammatology, and uh, investigations into the unconscious. 
The oxymoron of the Freudian robot is the avatar in a way that guides her inquiry into territory largely unexplored in our moment. If Ashil and Bembe um, uh, uh, launched our conference uh, yesterday with an account of technology and rationality, both instrumental and otherwise, I suspect Lydia will be directing our attention to the irrational elements in technology uh, and in uh, technologies, uh, plural, and in the various milieu from which they have emerged over time. Her title is The Psychic Life of Digital Media. Please join me in welcoming Lydia Liu. I almost took your paper with Thank you. Thank you very much. That happens. Good morning. Uh, I was aware. I, I was aware there was this traffic problem, but uh, thank you uh, uh, for the long wait. And uh, it's uh, uh, my honor and privilege to be here to uh, uh, share some of my uh, current thinking about uh, uh, informatics and uh, and other things, and the things that I learned over the past two days. Uh, both at the board meeting and uh, also in yesterday's discussion and, that, and also the incredible dance performance last night. Um, I, I wanted to thank Jim for your very generous introduction and I wanted to thank uh, uh, Sarah Geyer and Ravjani for inviting me, uh, uh, for welcoming me to this community. And um, when I received uh, Deb Jani's uh, formal invitation to speak last year, I looked at the six themes she has sent me um, and decided that I would focus on one of them, cybernetics and critical theory. I, was, I said that was perfect. Uh, I knew how to talk about it. Um, and you all know what the other themes are, so I don't have to repeat them here. After finishing my paper, however, I, at the, uh, I realized that I had taken on three themes rather than one. The other two being uh, human-machine intelligence and art, desire, and techno in in entanglements. Um, that's a lot of themes under one title, the sci psychic life of digital media, so I've decided to just run with the title and let the themes take care of themselves. So what, I do, what do I mean by the psychic life of digital media? I'm going to give you an answer over the next 45 minutes, a uh, tentative answer. But let me begin by uh, providing two contrasting scenarios, both involving the encounter or misencounter between a humanist and a scientist. One of the encounters took place in Munich between Martin Heidegger and quantum physicist Werner Heisenberg in 1953. The other one happened in the United States between Max Horkheimer and uh, Joseph uh, we Weizenbaum, both being German Jewish exiles. Uh, in World War II, although this encounter was virtual, or I would call intellectual, uh, rather than <coughs> actual documented meeting. Weizenbaum uh, probably is the only name that is unfamiliar to this group. Um, so uh, um, he uh, was a computer scientist at the MIT Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. Um, also, he was an AI pioneer and inventor of the first mind simulation program called ELISA. Uh, I think some of you would have heard of this, it's such a famous thing. Although he Heidelberg and Heisenberg had known each other as early as 1935, their 1953 meeting is important for our purpose here because it led to the essays that appeared in the following year as the question concerning technology, which are sheer and Bebby discussed so well in his uh, memorial lecture yesterday. Um, well, uh, um, Heidegger wrote most of these essays at the request of the Bavarian Academy of Fine Arts in Munich that also invited Heisenberg to speak on the question of technology in a week-long program on the arts in the technical age. Heisenberg spoke on what he called the, the picture of nature in modern physics. And in response, Heidegger wrote the question concerning technology and some of the other essays, um, in which he devoted 
extensive pages to discussion of the age of world picture, as many of you are aware. Uh, in short, the question concerning technology was the product of a coordinated dialogue between the philosopher and the quantum physicist. And we can, cannot begin to grasp the one without the other. Now, critical theorists Horkheimer and computer scientist Weizenbaum were not so lucky as to be given a platform like that of the Bavarian Academy through which they could engage each other in a sustained dialogue about instrumentalized or instrumental reason that interested both, th both of them. Instead, their encounter took the form of Weizenbaum's reading of Horkheimer's book, Eclipse of Reason, the first and the only computer scientist, as far as I know, who taught himself the essentials of critical theory. In his book, Eclipse of Reason, published in 1947, Horkheimer contends that technocratic consciousness begins to dominate social and political life when scientists and experts become the only social group who are given the power to determine the means of production, whereas everybody else is excluded from that public conversation. Democracy drifts into te te technocracy, and language is impoverished and reduced to mere instrument. What it means philosophy is that objective reason degenerates into subjective reason, that the language he uses, into formalism in the machinery of modern capitalist production and so on. Um, I think this group should be familiar with his argument from that book. This basically captures the spirit of the kind of critical discourse of uh, members of the Institute for Social Research who had been forced by the Nazis into exile from Frankfurt to New York and who then pursued a systematic critique of technology and instrumental reason, and capitalism. Horkheimer speaks about the kind of damage that machine, which he calls the apparatus, is capable of inflicting on reason. Now let's turn to Joseph uh, Weizenbaum. He was a computer scientist who read his Horkheimer, who read his Arendt, and published scathing criticisms of his MIT colleagues and te technological messiahs that was his term, whose work, he says, quote, merely justified, justified military spending and masked real political conflicts, end of quote. Critical theory inspired him to re re reflect on the situation of reason, and he points out, quote, we cannot, but um, we, can, we can count. I think yesterday the conversation briefly touched on measure. Um, quote, we can count but we're rapidly forgetting how to say what is worth counting and why, end of quote. So this sounds very, like, like, very much like uh, Horkheimer. And he read his Horkheimer, how do I know? He cited him, <laughs> and he cited Arendt. Um, uh, this gives us a, a rare glimpse on the kind of critical thinking that could be made possible when the minds meet halfway across the divide of science and the humanities. The problem is that none of the critical theorists, Horkheimer, Adorno, or even Habermas, made an attempt to meet the computer scientists halfway or even an inch. They did not know, for example, Weizenberg, uh, Weizenbaum pioneered in the invention of the mind simulation program, the first one, in the mid-60s. The program, ELISA, uh, um, was uh, written with a script called Doctor, which requires those who interact with the machine, the computer, to play the patient, while the machine doctor simulates the speech of therapist. Uh, observing how people talk to his machine from the mid-60s onwards, Weizenbaum was surprised to find how quickly and how deeply people became emotionally involved with the computer. His personal secretary had followed his work for many years, and she was perfectly aware that ELISA was just a computer program. And yet, she forgot all of this when she began conversing with Dr. Uh, Weizenbaum wrote, quote, after only a few exchanges, interchanges with it, she asked me to leave the room. Another time, <laughs> I suggested I might rig the system so I could examine all conversations anyone had with it, say, overnight, I was promptly 
bombarded with accusations that what I proposed amounted to spying on people's most intimate thoughts. <coughs> End of quote. After ELISA, the simulation model of the human mind has proliferated for many decades as computer scientists had uh, a, a, a a designed and tested their neurotic machines to model some theory of the mind or advance the cause of artificial intelligence down to this very day. Now, how would the critical theorists have reacted to this development, AI development? Had they paid any attention to this development, would they have considered the critique of the instrumentalization of reason sufficient? So that's my question. Today, we're surrounded by talks of cyborgs, androids, and post-humans, and many of us are infatuated with robots. We either love them or hate them, and we let them dominate our dreams and our social lives. It is as if we were caught in a narcissistic loop of human-machine sim simulacra. Recognizing this, Rodney Brooke proclaimed 13, uh, 15 years ago, quote, the distinction between us and robots is going to disappear. End of quote. He celebrated this. But it seems to me that something more profound and uncanny is taking place. We ought to ask some new question about the blurred distinction between humans and machines. Are humans evolving to some type of Freudian robots at the same pace as AI de engineers design their robots to resemble humans? In <coughs> short, is the uncanny valley becoming a two-way street? To understand the curious human-machine simulacra, one could pursue a straightforward sociological and political diagnosis of the social media, or learn from critical theory to analyze the younger generation's behavior in the age of uh, digital media. In fact, journalists and scholars have been doing precisely that. It seems to me, however, we also need a well-rounded theoretical grasp of the problem when confronted by human-machine <coughs> simulacra. What's wrong with our obsession with the intelligent machine? Why should one worry about such obsession and study it? Can we push such a study beyond the defense of reason in the manner of Horkheimer and other critical theorists? If my uh, hypothesis is correct, and I'm going to say it is correct, <laughs> <laughs> that is, human beings are evolving it, to resemble the intelligent machines we in we invent, even as we build robots to resemble human beings. The result of the ceaseless, ceaseless feedback loop is the coming of a new generation of cyborgs with peculiar human-machine interfaces. So I'm not as sanguine about cyborgs as some of the other theorists. I have a name for this new species, Freudian robot. Uh, thank you, Jim, for uh, showing the book, <laughs> that book. I wrote a, after read, having written a book about it, I'm now prepared to say that the Freudian robot figures the ultimate uncanny in the collective unconscious uh, dominated by the social media. N and let me elaborate on what I mean uh, uh, now by focusing on three interrelated points. Uh, and this is how I uh, wanted to approach the entanglement of humans and machines. Um, if I have the time, I'm watching the clock, uh, I could uh, uh, give justice to all three dimensions. The first one, uh, of course, is the classic essay by Freud, uh, The Uncanny. Uh, and then um, the second part uh, is uh, the work of Japanese uh, ro robot engineer, uh, uh, Masahiro Mori's hypothesis of the uncanny valley, which it turns out has become such a uh, jargon. Even my, su my students actually uh, uh, talk about the uncanny valley all the time. And I say, what do you know about it? <laughs> but in any case, and everybody is aware. <laughs> and uh, the, the third part is um, I wanted to go, go to uh, American um, AI founder, find Founding scientist uh, Marvin Minsky's idea of the emotion machine. Um, I'm not talking about affect here. I'm looking at very specific problem human machine interfaces here, um, and, and not affect in general. And and that's why we need to go back to Freud's analysis of the unconscious, especially this um, classic essay. But 
I'm, I'm aware that I don't have the time uh, to go over this. Luckily, this, this group would not need uh, much <laughs> introduction to Freud's uh, classic essay. Now, uh, what is the place of a psychoanalysis in digital media? Um, Freud, as you, you're aware, was never so uh, convinced that reason uh, would, could save us. Uh, and, and then uh, I'm not applying Freud to the study of me digital media. I wanted to demonstrate how Freud was already part of digital media, was always part of uh, the thinking and the invention and the designing of these machines that you have. Um, that, well, the, the simulation model de designed by uh, Weizenbaum, uh, Eliza, was not uh, based on Freud's um, model, but you know, uh, there were others like Marvin Minsky who did proclaim claim himself as a neo-Freudian, and he was the founder of inter in artificial intelligence. In it, so this is basically the scope that I wanted to touch on. Uh, um, and also I wanted to mention, in cybernetics, uh, Lawrence Kuby was a core member of the Macy Conference Group. Um, and then Lacan developed his important notion of the symbolic by engaging uh, with game theory and information theory, uh, and by rethinking Freud through that lens in a series of seminars he conducted in 1954 and 55. I won't touch on Lacan because I've already written a chapter on that in, in the book. Um, and then uh, if you look at uh, artificial intelligence and robotics, Freud's ideas are everywhere alive, <coughs> including this Japanese uh, uh, idea of uh, uncanny valley. Okay, Freud was fascinated with uh, automata when he wrote this essay. Um, well, uh, in 1919, um, essentially the essay was a, a, a analysis of the story of Sandman by uh, Hoffman. Now, Freud pays close attention to uh, a lot of things uh, uh, in, in his reading, but he studied his essay by critiquing uh, Jens' reading of Hoffman. So th this is very cru crucial. We, we think that Freud is simply reading Hoffman. No, no, he was refuting Jens' reading of Sandman. Uh, 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 sorry. Why refuting him? Uh, it was Jens who first brought the idea of uncanny into the discussion in his reading. He was fo focusing on uh, a lot of things, uh, uh, wax figures, uh, panopticons, panoramas, and automatic toys in his study as instances of the uncanny. And of course, lifetime uh, automata. And doors that can open, close and open their eyes by themselves. As you can see how uh, Hoffman's story uh, can be related to all of these. And so, but it was not just an exercise in literary uh, criticism. Something more is at stake. Um, so he advanced uh, an argument which uh, Freud refutes. And I think to this day, uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding as to exactly where Freud stands on this question. I'll give you a quote. Uh, the uncertainty whether an object is living or inanimate, which admittedly applied to the doll Olympia, is quite irrelevant in connection with this other more striking instance of uncanniness. So, so uh, was Jens' uh, argument that the undecidability, that is the uncertainty whether something is living or uh, inanimate, is the source of the <coughs> uncanny. Freud says, no, 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 that's not. Uh, instead, he says, uh, the uncanny is something which is familiar and old established in the mind and which has been alienated from it only through the process of repression. This is your classic Freudian reading. This reference to the factor of repression enables us furthermore to understand Schelling's definition of the uncanny as something which ought to have remained hidden but has come to light. Uh, all right, I'm just quickly 
uh, uh, going through uh, this uh, Freud's uh, earlier reflections on this. And of course, his readings were f focused on uh, who uh, a question uh, in, in the narrative of Hoffman, who is the automaton in uh, Der Sandmann? Okay, so that was the, the issue. Um, Olympia or uh, Natania or, or both. Uh, uh, Freud says uh, a, a one could read the story to perhaps identify the castration complex as the source of the uncanny. I'm not sure I will go with him on this issue, but I think he was quite um, a, astute by taking our attention from Olympia to the to the narrator, uh, Nathaniel, as uh, the the location where we can study the problem of the uncanny, and I I I, I am I would push him further. That is, um, the narrator itself uh, himself is also an automaton. It's my reading. Okay, so there are two automata, not one. Uh, um, so a. As, as we know, um, a, there were many modelings of the mind way before the uh, computer simulation programs. Um, so we have uh, Hoffman's modelling of the mind. Uh, we have Freud's reading uh, um, uh, psychoanalytical model modelling of the mind. Um, and then uh, a, we have the next stage in the 20th century, a very specific kind of computer simulations of the mind, including, of course, as we have seen, uh, uh, Weizenbaum and also Colby uh, Parry, the, a big deal, um, a, a machine that uh, uh, was designed uh, uh, to simulate uh, the speech of um, a patient who suffers paranoia. Uh, you know the the computer can identify patterns. Um, so we're talking about the 60s, the 70s, when they were developing this. And artificial is part of artificial intelligence uh, research. And so that brings us to uh, the Uncanny Valley. Uh, one of the latest developments um, in this uh, area has emerged from the work of engineers, robot scientists, and psychiatrists in what has been termed the Uncanny Valley Hypothesis. This hypothesis was first put forth by uh, Mori in 1970, who speculated that as robots become progressively human-like, our sense of empathy and familiarity increases until we come to the uncanny valley. And at this point, the robots will start to elicit negative feelings in us. Uh, after s going through the various kinds of prosthetic hands, uh, he wrote in this essay uh, that the new technology of AI further animates the prosthetic minds by enabling the fingers to move automatically. This will cause the animated hand to slide toward the bottom of the uncanny valley. Uh, let me show you this. Uh, uh, can you see it clearly? Yes, this is from the technical um, journal that where he published this hypothesis. Um, so uh, there is a um, there is a I think I've included an English version of it so you can see uh, clearly uh, how it works. This <laughs> so uh, this is has become an a a, a, a industry standard for. Uh, producing animations in Hollywood films, and also for producing uh, robots. Um, so that, as I said, Freud is, is very much embedded in the standard and the creation of it. So certain things, zombie, corpse, prosthetic hands can be, can make you, you know, really uh, uh, react negatively, he says. Whereas there are some lovable <laughs> uh, toys, uh, and he gives you, Homer ride uh, a robot industri industry stuffed animal. People love it as long as the animal cannot do certain weird things, right? <laughs> <laughs> to drop into the uncanny valley, and so this is the kind of research he did. 
He places the healthy person at, at the top of the second peak and the prosthetic hand near the bottom of the uncanny valley. And I show you the hand that he actually uh, used to illustrate and it was designed by himself, uh, his, his team. And then here is a close up. You see, very much so. Um, um, one thing he mentions is that, uh, uh, well, uh, you see, um, a hand that is designed so much alike a human hand, and, and it moves, and you go and shake it. It's, it's cold. <laughs> it has a zombie-like uh, effect. That's, that's the problem. Um, so he had to theorize this. Who did, you, did he turn to? Freud. Um, so then, what is the uncanny valley in uh, a artificial intelligence? So there, there's a theory of it. Um, the appearance is human-like, but the familiarity is negative. And uh, this is uh, uh, the uncanny valley. So that's his definition. And then uh, he, he gives these examples. We have seen very detailed uh, for, for the engineers. They really need to abide by the standard. Uh, there are Hollywood movies, uh, early uh, motion capture uh, uh, techniques that uh, uh, that uh, would raise these questions as well. And, and therefore, they, when the audience reacted negatively to some new films newly released, then uh, you would get critics talking about the uncanny valley there. And that's how, through popular culture, this idea uh, got disseminated. Uh, for example, do people recognize this one? <laughs> tin Toy, Tin Toy, very early. A 1988 uh, Pixar Animation Studios film, short film. Uh, and then uh, there's something really weird with the Polar Express 2000, 2004. Uh, do the eyes, do the eyes move? Uh, you know, there's that. And then uh, much later, uh, uh, 2007, um, we have the digital actors created with motion capture in Beowulf. So you recognize her. <laughs> okay. So the then, um, and, and then uh, you would have computer-generated image. Uh, and, you know, these images proliferate, prolifer proliferate on the internet. And all of these then tie into the discussion of the uncanny valley that we have, uh, we have seen. Um, OK, so now, uh, now I turn to Marvin Minsky. Uh, this was the same crowd of people, uh, people who had invented um, artificial, artificial intelligence. The popular um, robot from the Kubrick film 2001, as you probably recall, uh, the film was made in 1968, and it was inspired by the AI developments in, in the US and by some of the actual robot models that screenplay writer Arthur Clarke encountered in MIT's Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, um, where uh, both Marvin Minsky and uh, Joseph Weizenbaum worked. Uh, and then this laboratory uh, is rightly regarded as the, you know, really the heart of artificial intelligence and robot science research. One question that is seldom raised by people who study AI is the following. Where does Freud stand in Minsky's work on robot, robotics and in the AI research programs initiated by him? Minsky had long engaged with Freud and psychoanalysis in unique and fascinating ways. We find his acknowledgment of Freud in his early books, such as The Society of Mind, published in 86, and The Emotion Mach Machine, which came out uh, uh, 12 years ago, but then he died a few years ago, recently. Um, his work suggests that Freudian psychoanalysis has shadowed the cybernet cybernetic experiments of AI engineers and theorists throughout the second half of the 20th century down to the present. Minsky's, so, you know, whether you like Freud or not, whether you think he, his hypothesis can be verified or not, that's beside the point. He is deeply embedded in the research itself. Uh, Minsky's pioneering work on randomly wired uh, neural network machine was inspired initially by Warren McCulloch's and 
Walter Pitt's work on neural sets. This, was work, this work was developed by the Macy Conference people, that is the cybernetics group. Later, Minsky professes conflicting allegiance to McCulloch and Freud, and practically characterizes his own project as neo-Freudian. He wrote about this. With the AI robotics program in mind, Minsky draws on Freud's ideas about the unconscious and tries to reformulate them with the help of, of uh, Jean Piaget's work on co cognition and learning processes. This is a, a difficult enterprise because a humanoid robot is much more is a much more um, ambitious and complex simulation project than uh, Eliza, um, or than Kobe and what Kobe and his team could possibly envision in their neurotic machine. I'm not calling them neurotic, they, call, they themselves call their machines <laughs> neurotic machine, right? Okay, Perry, for example, the paranoid machine, <laughs> machine on parano paranoia. The construction of such robots entails formidable technical obstacles, and more important, it raises fundamental philosophical questions about cognition, memory, reflexivity, consciousness, and so on. Uh, for example, what makes human beings unique or not so unique? You really have to construct m model robots to answer the question. It's not, it's not a definition. You have to make thing, the thing work. Um, all right. Uh, so uh, in all this time, uh, we have uh, uh, films, which I mentioned, that would uh, give you some kind of answer. Uh, and then uh, it, uh, Minsky, uh, for those of you who wanted to follow up on this, uh, at, at the same time, they were coming up with philosophers of arti artificial intelligence, n nothing like what you hear in the media today, uh, um, uh, that it seemed to aim to attract investors <laughs> more so than <laughs> really talking about seriously about this, this discussion, which has been going on for decades. Alan Turing, for example, uh, treated the mind as a simple processing machine. Um, a, uh, I don't have the time to go into that. Um, uh, Francisco Varela and, uh, and his uh, co-authors wrote the book, The Embodied Mind, to uh, address this problem, the philosophical dimension of it. Uh, imagine um, Heidegger doing something like this. Uh, imagine what Hockheimer would have said about this, right? Uh, if you know, Hockheimer had paid attention, uh, then Marvin Minsky. So all of them, I think, as I was working, doing my research from the cybernetics group from the 40s all the way, uh, a lot of these mathematicians and engineers did not treat the mind as a rational uh, calculating machine. No, they, they, they were very clear about it. They were interested in the unconscious, and they were extremely fascinated by the irrational in the humans. And so we cannot simply come up with a, a dividing line and then say the scientists are all believing in a, a rational, some kind of a rational mind, it's not. Um, they were well aware of the complexity of the situation. Um, which is why Marvin Minsky wanted to approach the mind as an emotion machine. Again, it's, it's totally different from what people do in ethics uh, studies. Okay. Um, essentially, he had to uh, be very technically sp uh, uh, specific about uh, how to design the, uh, the robot, so uh, with the frames, terminals, network system, bugs, and suppression. What is so fascinating uh, about, a, about his engagement with Freud is that in developing the robotic model, Minsky uh, uh, sh uh, comes up with this, um, uh, the frames, the terminals. Uh, he tried to bring Freud into this. Uh, it's fascinating. You don't have to buy it, but it was his uh, hypothesis. And and he also hypothesized that intelligence is probably related to repression. I, I haven't heard anyone making this argument. And therefore, a, a truly, truly humanoid robot should 
also built this system in. Repression, drive, see, that's his design, uh, a, which is fascinating. Um, it's not, this has not been built yet. <laughs> this was his, before he died, he, this was his uh, conception uh, of a future robot. Um, all right, uh, I think my time is uh, uh, um, running up. He, here's what he ha has to say about, um, about the con c mental co correctors, suppressors, sensors, and so on. Um, because robots, future robots, must be equipped with these to allow it to function at a highly intelligent level. So intelligence is you know, connected there. It's not verifiable, but it's his Freudian approach. Um, this new Freudian approach leads to his dismissal of rationality as a kind of fantasy. So we're talking about the scientist thinking in those terms. Minsky argues that, quote, our thinking is never entirely based on purely logical reasoning. Uh, most of our future attempts to build large, growing artificial intelligence will be subject to all sorts of mental disorders, end of quote. That was him talking. What is more interesting, fictional robot uh, Hell 2023 pops up in the middle of his discussion to confirm, so we have a robot speaking in his own voice. My designers equip me with special backup memory banks in which I can store snapshots of my entire state. So whenever anything goes wrong, I can see exactly what my programs have done so I can then debug myself. So, it, it, so this was, a, it gives you an, the image of a future um, robot. Um, this, if this sounds like a f science fiction, Minsky proposes, quote, we must try to design as opposed to define machines that can do what human minds do, end of quote. Because until one can simulate the cognitive machinery of the mind in all its respects, one cannot fully understand how the human mind works. Minsky's formulation of the cognitive unconscious um, then uh, consists of all these uh, parts that we have seen, and the lack of unity in the unconscious derives from the interplay of sense and nonsense in a complex ve uh, web of relations. Um, this uh, um, brings us back to Horkheimer's critique of the instrumentalization of reason, uh, in which in his book, Eclipse of Reason, he repeatedly refers to the de-association, de uh, disconnecting of uh, la words from meaning. Okay, so uh, a, a, a sense uh, and you know, sense and, and nonsense. Uh, it's, it's, it's you should find some uh, uh, echoes here. Um, somehow, language is the site of uh, investigation of reason and unreason. Um, this was certainly uh, the, the work of uh, critical uh, theorists. Now, uh, but then, uh, I'm not sure, as I said earlier, uh, the defense of reason is the task here. Uh, that would lead us astray, which means that we cannot even uh, begin to think about what Minsky's, Minsky and his teams are really up to. Um, they think that you know, rationality, uh, a type of reason, is a fantasy. But the problems with them is uh, for uh, someone like Minsky, a self-styled neo-Freudian, he has neglected to consider the mechanisms of repression with respect to one thing, which fascinated Freud. That is the death drive. They were talking about replacing body parts so you can live forever, immortals, right? Okay, so he overlook this one um, central uh, problem that Freud identified in his work. And what would the place of the uncanny be once death is conquered? Can death be conquered? Is the desire to master the unconscious but a manifestation of the death drive that Freud has discerned in a human civilization? And I'm concluding with 
uh, uh, Arthur Clarke's visit to Bell Labs in the mid 50s, where he learned about, he was there to learn about the spectacular post war developments in communication te technology in the United States. He went into Shannon, Claude Shannon's office, Claude Shannon being the inventor of information theory. And there he encountered a, an automaton called the ultimate machine. Now, uh, OK, so oh, this is Minsky, uh, Arthur Clark, <laughs> Shannon. All right, so, uh, and he recalls what he saw. Nothing could look simpler. It's merely a small wooden casket the size and shape of a cigar box with a single switch on one face. When you throw the switch, there's an angry, purposeful buzzing. The lid slowly rises, and from beneath emerges a hand. <laughs> the hand reaches down, turns the switch off, and retreats into the box. With the finality of a closing coffin, the lid snaps shut. The psychological effect if, <laughs> effect, if you do not know what to expect, is devastating. There's something unspeakably sinister about the machine that does nothing, absolutely nothing, <laughs> except switch itself off. <laughs> if you would like to collect one of these boxes, a lot of people are fans of this uh, ultimate machine. Many of them have designed their own models. I actually purchased one, <laughs> which, which has been renamed as a useless m machine useless machine because this machine was designed to do nothing but shut itself off. And I'm going to give you a clip of uh, one of my, this is not the original Shannon one, but it gives you an idea. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>